So again, for the rest of this video, xd will always denote a metric space. As might be somewhat intuitive, we can define the notion of open sets in metric spaces just as we did for open sets of Euclidean space. But instead of using rectangles, we'll use open disks. We already showed that rectangles and open disks in Euclidean space are equivalent, so we might as well do something like that here. A subset, A, of x is open if and only if for every point in A, there exists some open ball contained in A. So there exists some R greater than zero such that, and just to be clear since I didn't define this yet, the ball of radius R, which is defined by the set of all points Y in X, such that the distance from X to Y is less than r, is a subset of a. This is what it means for a subset of x to be open. A subset b of x is closed if and only if the complement of b in x is open. And with these definitions, we can define a topology on X So let me at least define what a topology is on an arbitrary set first and then say how um, a metric space gives us a topology So topology on X, which we denote by tau, is a subset of the power set of X. So this is the set of all subsets of X satisfying the following three conditions. First, the empty set and the space itself, the set itself, are in tau. If an arbitrary collection A sub alpha with alpha in some index set I are all in tau, then their union is also in tau. And three, if I have a finite collection of elements in tau, then their intersection is also in tau. And typically, we call the elements of tau, we call these specific subsets of X, we call them open sets. And X equipped with this collection of subsets is called a topological space. And the claim is that the collection of open sets with this definition for a metric space, if X is a metric space, then the open sets of the definition above, let's call this definition 1 and this definition 2, that the open sets of definition 1 satisfy the conditions of definition 2.
In other words, if you have a metric space, you can get a canonical topology by using the open disks of varying radii at every different point in that space. Now that we're talking about topological spaces, an example of this is what we've already been studying at the early part of the semester, which are Euclidean spaces. And we already know what it means to have a continuous function from one Euclidean space to another, and it only involved using this definition of a topology. Remember, a function between Euclidean spaces is continuous if and only if the inverse image of an open set is open. We also had different epsilon delta characterizations of what it means for a function to be continuous. And if you notice, the epsilon delta definitions use the notion of distance. So if we have a notion of distance, we can define what it means to be continuous. If we have a topology, we can define what it means to be continuous. And we can compare those two definitions. In the case of Euclidean spaces, they were equivalent. So you might wonder if something like that's still true here. But also for continuous functions between or rather for functions between Euclidean spaces, we also made sense of various other definitions. For instance, we talked about Lipschitz functions and differentiable functions and things like that. So which of those different kinds of functions are transferable to the setting of metric spaces? We begin with the most strict kind of notion of a map of metric spaces. So for now, let me denote x with a subscript dx for a metric space and y dy. And that's because what we're going to look at is functions between these. So these are metric spaces. And let f be a function from x to y. And we say that this is, and what we're going to do is list a bunch of candidates for different kinds of functions between metric spaces is an isometry. This is sort of the strongest uh, condition that we can ask for. And an isometry is a function that preserves the distances on the nose. So if I try to draw whatever I can, I have a notion of distance from x to I have a notion of distance on x, I have a notion of distance on y, and I have a function f, I can ask for this diagram to commute. And that's what it means for us to have an isometry. It's that if I take x and x prime, I calculate its distance, and if I push forward to f of x, f of x prime, calculate that distance, those two distances must be equal. So this preserves all distances. And you can check that an isometry is automatically one-to-one. -one. I leave that to you as an exercise. Another kind of definition that's sort of distance preserving is the following, a contraction. In fact, this is sort of like distance uh, decreasing in a certain sense, and I'll say in what sense soon. If and only if there exists some number alpha between zero and one, not including one, that's very, very important, such that the distance in y from f of x to f of x prime is less than or equal to alpha times the distance from x to x prime for all inputs x and x prime. Another definition is distance decreasing if and only if something very similar to this happens but it looks quite different it actually doesn't involve the choice of an alpha f of x f of x prime is less than strictly the distance between x and x prime whenever x and x prime are distinct Clearly, if x equals x prime, these are equal to zero. But what this is saying is that for all other points, the distance between them is always strictly decreasing. Another notion is Lipschitz. Oof. Definitely going to spell this wrong. <laughs> is Lipschitz, if and only if, 
there exists. This one's very similar to the definition of a contraction, but we allow our number to be any uh, non-negative number. So if there exists an m in 0 to infinity, not including infinity, that wouldn't make sense, such that the distance between the images is always less than or equal to that number times the distance between x and x prime. <clears throat> and yet one more definition. Function is continuous if and only if. And again, there are two different kinds of candidates we could write down. Let's write down the one that we might be more familiar with, which I think is a little bit harder to, to write down, but um, it uses the metric. Is continuous if and only if, well actually I should mean is continuous at C, if and only if, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that if I take x in the ball of radius delta around C, and then I take its image, that point lies in the epsilon ball of radius, sorry, the epsilon ball around f of c of radius epsilon. And then a function is continuous on all of x if and only if it's continuous at c for every c in x. So you can compare these different definitions you know, if, if they're all related or not, um, and some of them imply others while some of them don't imply the others. And we have the following chart. So an isometry, if you have an isometry, then an isometry is in particular Lipschitz because I can set m to equal 1. And then this inequality, where are we? Um, Lipschitz. And this inequality actually becomes inequality. So isometry implies Lipschitz, implies Lipschitz. Lipschitz implies continuous. And it actually turns out that contraction and distance decreasing are, they might not be what you expect. If I can choose alpha to be some number between 0 and 1, not including 1, then this number is strictly less than 1, and that means that this is strictly less than the distance between x and x prime. So that actually easily proves that a contraction is automatically distance decreasing. And a contraction is a special case of a Lipschitz function. So contraction implies Lipschitz. And you can also show that distance decreasing implies continuous. It's also true that distance decreasing is Lipschitz. But none of these arrows go in the other direction. So there are examples of continuous functions that aren't Lipschitz, continuous, not distance decreasing, distance decreasing, not contractions, and so on. So all of these are strict directions of implications with no necessary, no um, converses in general for arbitrary metric spaces. And so the question is, we have a lot of different notions of what functions should be between metric spaces. And because of these implications, the most, the most number of different types of functions that we could possibly have are the set of continuous functions between two metric spaces. And fewer and fewer go further and further out. So there are very few isometries between metric spaces, but there might be tons of continuous functions between metric spaces. And isolating which ones are important for which particular uh, problems you're looking at uh, is an important question to ask um, when you're trying to solve certain problems.